All right, now let's go back to the initial contact. So you can look at the FM. There's eight battle drills. I can't name them all anymore. But again, we don't differentiate between react to contact, react to ambush, break contact, and all that stuff because it can all be the same at the same time or they can all be very different. However, one thing you might want to practice with your team is different formations. So let's say we're in a file. Why would we be in a file? Well, maybe it's dark as hell and the terrain sucks and we want to stay in contact with each other. So we'll get in a, what people call a ranger file. Or let's say you're using game trails through horrible terrain and you cannot be in a wedge. It's just not physically possible, all right? Whatever, you're in a file. Well, now you're taking contact, okay? So we're simulating a woodland environment where you can maneuver a little bit. There's what we call a ranger peel. You typically don't do that in a wood line if you can move, but there's a couple things you can do. And once again, a thousand variables for every decision. This is something that's usually written into your team SOP, what you're going to do, okay? And again, Oakoke, terrain dictates. So let's say the terrain is so bad, you're on a game trail. You cannot go off the trail, all right? So you're gonna do basically what we call a ranger peel, all right? This guy mag dumps, back to the back. This guy mag dumps, boom. Now the problem with that is if this dude has a clear line of sight, he can basically mow you all down, but hey, you should have thought about that before you started walking down this game trail like that. You guys see what I'm getting at? This is why the infantry world is so fun. As soon as you think you've got something solved, the enemy or the terrain kicks you in the nuts and you've got bigger problems. All right, so let's say we're in a wood line and we can get off this trail a little bit. Now, I know people think about briar patches and manzanitas and stuff, but if you're getting shot at, you're gonna find a way to get through that stuff. Um, that's why we wear knee pads and, and gear and heavy duty clothing, because you're gonna sprint through sticker brushes. Believe me, you'll do it. Let's say we're coming out of a game trail, all right, we've got an open area. We take contact from the enemy. Well, this guy is definitely pinned down, but he's trying to get down and shoot. Everybody gets down. These guys are trying to figure out what's going on, and they should split off a little bit to make sure they're not shooting their buddies. So now what are we in? We're in kind of a wedge formation again. When the team leader makes the call on what to do, that's one of the first things he's going to do is turn around and see if his guys are where they should have been. This is one reason when we're practicing our movements. So if you want to have fun with your team, just go out through the mountains and maneuver with your team. And if the team leader is not dictating where his guys should go, so hopefully the team leader is smart, and when it's time to go to a file, he will call it, and he will also call when to go back to the wedge. If not, this is why we train. Sometimes the team leader forgets or he's busy, and Joes should be thinking about stuff. So these guys come out of a game trail and there's a wide open field. I would expect my guys to automatically go to a wedge. And that's how we would train. You're allowed to make decisions in the infantry, believe it or not. So I would tell my guys, I shouldn't have to tell you what freaking formation to be in. Now, if we were in a field in Afghanistan where something could be mined, then we might want to stick to a file. In that case, I might dictate to my guys, hey, we don't know about mines here, so I know we should be in a wedge, it's a wide open field, but let's stay in a file so we're not putting this big footprint in a possible minefield, all right? So at least only one guy goes down. It sucks, but it's how we do things. What about near and far ambush, okay? What I did not like about the, the army doctrine is we designate that based on hand grenade range. So the book says 35 meters or hand grenade range. And I always thought that was kind of silly because I grew up playing baseball. I could throw a grenade well over 35 meters. So I never liked that cut and dry term. The way we saw it when we actually started getting into combat, a near ambush could be 50 meters. It could be 100 meters. If you're in trucks, a near ambush could be 200 meters. A lot of it depends on the volume of fire you are receiving and the terrain. How can we maneuver? 
So a near and far ambush in the wood line or in the wide open is going to be totally different from the categories of near and far ambush in a mount environment. You could be in trucks, say this is four trucks, and you, you're in an alleyway with your trucks and you're just getting assaulted from the rooftops, but they're over a hundred meters away. Is that a far ambush because it's outside a hand grenade range? Hell no, man, they got RPGs, they got mortars. They're shooting down at us. Something could blow up in front of us to block our path. You guys see what I'm getting at. Um, this is why you gotta be able to think in the grunt world. And this is why we train nonstop. Friggin' dry runs, rehearsals, nonstop. Even in garrison, if we're bored, we're out there freaking pew pewing and pretending. Okay, so let's talk about why we differentiate between the two. A near ambush is so deadly, you have to assault through it. A far ambush means you can actually get away from it, right? So this kind of comes from the Vietnam jungle style warfare. Guys would get into contact that was so close within 30 feet of the enemy, they had no choice. If these guys are in contact in an ambush, that's a near ambush within, we'll say within 30 meters in the jungle, they have to assault through because if they try to run away or bound back, or if they try to get online or anything, everybody's dead. So again, everything freaking dictates what you do. So that's your near and far ambush. But again, if we're talking about this stuff in a Minuteman perspective, you, you just need to look at things and train with your guys and say, okay, well, this is what we're going to consider a near ambush, all right? So if we're ambushed within hand grenade range and this guy drops, all right? We have no choice to, we can't abandon that guy and we're so close, we've got to go get those bad guys. This is SOP and training, standard operating procedures. Okay, so people might say, well, what's the difference between all this and react to contact? Well, guys, react to contact is just the battle drill that comes before all the other stuff. React to contact can stop as soon as everybody's gotten down into the prone, hopefully behind cover, and started returning fire. You have reacted to contact. Now we're either going to react to an ambush or we're going to break contact. So if you're curious, you can look up uh, Battle Drill 1 and 1 Alpha, Platoon and Squad Attack. That's when you're actually going out to attack whatever, an objective, building bad guys in the woods, bad guy camp, whatever. If we're talking about the Minuteman context, I don't see that happening unless magically you got 30 freaking armed dudes showing up. Um, you have very good intel on the bad guy camp and you know you can go kick their ass. Other than that, I see the great majority of modern Minuteman tactics being break contact, okay? Now let's say in the process of breaking contact, the team leader or somebody else finally realizes that it's just one dude taking pop shots at him, all right? Well, this is where we can actually start to think. So let's say we're breaking contact. Um, the volume of fire has decreased significantly. So we can kind of regroup. Let's say we, we've gotten back to this wood line and the team leader is making his next decision. This guy can be like, hey, I only saw one dude with a freaking 30-30 taking shots at us. I think we could take this guy. Well, what's our SOP, guys? What are, what are we doing? Are, are we trying to take something over here? Are we trying to get intel? Are we really trying to kill bad guys? This is where you can get into a number of scenarios. But just to stick with basic battle drills, let's say the team leader says, okay, everybody agrees we can probably take this dude. Let's do it. All right. So how do we get, we just bounded back. We're in a wood line. How do we get to where this one guy is taking pop shots at us? This is battle drill one and one alpha. It doesn't have to be a platoon or a squad. It can actually be a fire team. Well, there's a couple things we can do, guys. You can bound back to where you were and re-engage with this dude, and now he sees you coming back. Before you leave your wood line, which should be cover and concealment, at the minimum it's concealment, you're gonna conduct a quick objective rally point, all right? Make a little battle plan. You got at least one dude watching that direction, and you're coming up with a quick battle plan. Hey guys, I think we should 
take this defilade on this flank and try to get up there and maneuver and take this guy out. What do you guys think? I would always ask my guys what they thought, if we had the time. Otherwise, if, if it's a dire situation, I'm making the decisions, that's my job. All right, so let's say we want to get moving. The team leader says, we're going to take that defilade and try to flank this guy. All right, so these guys are going to get to where they can re-engage. Using the cover and concealment, or at least the concealment, Oakoke, these guys get down into the defilade. Boop, 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 boop. They're flanking. This is where land navigation and knowing Oakoke and all that stuff is key. The team leader has to be able to trust these guys to be able to use that defilade to get somewhere up to where this guy is, the general area. And these guys have to be dependable enough to actually do that, all right? Nothing is cut and dry, nothing is simple when you're actually in contact, okay? I'm just keeping this simple to have fun with it, move beer cans around. But also just to kind of show you guys the, the, the things we go through and the things you should think about when you're out there training. When I talk about a thousand variables for every decision, this is where the training comes in. You should have a guy controlling the training and he gives guys a basic combat scenario and they have to react. Let them do their battle drills a little bit and then all of a sudden inject something. You know, say, hey, yeah, they found the defilade. They got up here, but this guy crested that hill too much. This guy noticed him and shot him in the freaking chest. This guy's down now. So now you've broken contact from this team. You have guys separated and either this guy told you via radio, maybe you saw this guy go down, or maybe you only see one rifle shooting or only hear one rifle shooting what the hell did you do now? This is why smaller teams generally try to just break contact because once you start trying to attack an objective, something goes wrong, <clears throat> you're done. Can this guy evacuate the dude? Well, I hope so. I hope he's strong and fit enough and we've just been fighting. We patrolled all day, we got into a fight. Now this guy's gotta be tough enough to carry the dude or does he have to call these guys up to come rescue him? Well, now we just turned a break contact into assault and objective. We got a man down and now we're much closer to the enemy. And just for the hell of it, this guy was just to draw these guys into an ambush. Now all of a sudden 30 freaking bad guys pop up. The whole team's wiped out. <laughs> so you guys see what I mean? You can sit around getting drunk with your buddies and you can just rehearse stuff like this and go through it. This is where you decide what your SOPs are gonna be. And once you actually get out into the field and start practicing this stuff, it's where you rehearse your battle drills, your, you test your SOPs. You should always be testing your SOPs. I always found it frustrating when I was a team and then later a squad leader, we would go through this stuff constantly. We would learn our SOPs and then we would go to the field for training or even worse, we would be in combat and we would have to adjust our SOPs on the fly. Um, Ramadi, we had to update our SOPs almost weekly. That's just how bad it was. Now, just because I know people are going to want to see it, let's go ahead and clear this objective, all right? Let's say we were bounding back. Guy over here on the right flank says he dropped this dude. He's like, yep, I saw him go down. Everybody realizes they're not being shot at anymore. All right, so now we need to assault through that objective if the team leader decides he wants to. It's nice and quiet. We think we killed the dude. We're still in the area of engagement. We're, we're not in that wood line yet, or we're not in the defilade yet. All right, so let's say, all right, well, we wanna get up there and get some intel. So there's a lot of ways to do this. The basic way is contact is expected. It's not likely, it's not possible. It is expected because we've just been in a firefight. So we need to do what is called bounding overwatch. Very simple. Instead of just walking up there like idiots, you know, um, just patrolling, contact is expected. We expect other bad guys to be over here. We need to do this in a methodical manner. So these guys can become support by fire and we, do, we can use the defilade to flank and get up here. These guys become support by fire now these guys can either move straight up or maybe find some concealment on the other flank and come up. Again, guys, a thousand freaking choices. So 
or let's do the or or um, maybe we have some trees or some defilade depressions and stuff up to the objective well we can just bound up these guys can bound up to the next point of cover this is kind of what you would do and react to contact bound up once we get up there we're all set all right so we haven't taken any more contact we're all good to go everybody's online what do we do now the traditional infantry way is assault through an objective okay one pair is going to become the support by fire we always have somebody ready to shoot the other one's going to be the assaulting element all right <clears throat> let's say the team leader and his buddy become support by fire these guys now move online in this direction all right so we're not shooting at each other and these guys are going to cross through the objective and if we're talking about in the context of minuteman and all that stuff I don't know if we're taking prisoners. I think that's also going to depend on what's happening. These guys are basically, their job is to assault through and get to the other side. These guys are not searching guys, they're not arresting guys, but if there's a threat, they're taking it out. So they're gonna assault through. Get to the other side this is their limit of advance loa loa sops there should be an sop for when these guys assault through there should be an sop for how they call out their limit of advance that just means they're at the furthest point generally by doctrine the loa for the assaulting element is the last man on the support by fire but i'll tell you right now in the real world, this guy's not gonna know where the hell this guy is. This guy's gonna be yelling, last man. Hey, I'm over here, dude. So he's probably gonna pass him up. The point is, the assaulting element doesn't need to go super far away. You actually wanna kinda stay in this L shape, all right? It's not going to look like a perfect L, I guarantee you, in any terrain. So now that your assaulting element is through, they put a couple pop shots in that dude, make sure he's down, there's no other threats. Now, the support by fire element can come in and do whatever has to be done on the ground. Intel collection, you know, search the guy if maybe he's still alive, take a prisoner, things like that. These guys' job is to be security on everything else. This is also where we get into lace reports. So before we leave that objective, the team leader's got to check on his guys. Liquids, ammo, casualties, and equipment. It's basically just a rundown of and an inventory of everything we have and to make sure everybody is good to go. Make sure we didn't lose weapons or sights or something like that. Make sure everybody's actually okay. I've seen plenty of guys that did get shot or take shrapnel and didn't realize it until this point. So that is basically how you would assault an objective. Well, there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed uh, battle drills with beer cans. Um, we didn't cover a great majority of them. You got knockout bunker, enter clear trench, um, enter building clear room. That's your CQB mount stuff. I like to stick to the basics because if you know react contact and ambush on the ground at this basic level, all you have to do for everything else is just adjust, right? So the same way you're gonna get up to an objective in the wood line or in a field, is the same way you're going to get up to that bunker to knock it out. It's the same way you're gonna get up to that trench and then in the buildings and such. If you can remember Oacoke, right? Observations, avenues of approach, cover and concealment, um, key terrain. If you can remember that stuff, those are the crucial decision-making variables that you have to consider. And this is a job that every single dude should be able to do. So what we would do is we would usually kill the team leader early on, all right? So then another Joe has to step up. And what's even more fun during training is you kill the team leader and the OC, observer controller, the guy controlling the training, he doesn't dictate who's in charge now. So like you see in the movies, he's dead, you're in charge, what do you do? No, you kill the team leader, 
and you let the other guys decide. Whoever steps up in that moment, you're gonna see a lot of guys hesitate. Three, two alphas down. <clears throat> There's gonna be a lot of hesitation. There's gonna be a lot of looking around at each other. Somebody is going to have to make that call to step up and become the team leader. Now, everybody else has to get in line with the guy who is courageous enough to step up because the other guys know they hesitated. He stepped up and answered the call. Now he's making the shots. If he's a total moron, hopefully you don't have him on your team to begin with, but you're going to have some issues there that you're going to have to sort out. But if team leaders down this guy's a dipshit and he immediately steps up why didn't you step up to begin with right if you know the guy's a dipshit why didn't you step up before him so maybe dipshit might actually rise and shine in combat and impress you again guys doctrine is extremely simple with us and it's purposely built that way we don't have tons of FMs on battle drills. If, if you look at uh, FM 7-7, 7-8, 3-21.8, .8, look at Special Forces Small Unit Tactics, look at the Ranger Handbook, the battle drills are almost the same. All right, Small Unit Tactics book, uh, Ranger Handbook, it all takes the battle drills from the infantry, and then they just put their own little spin on it. So that's the whole point to this. Go out there, practice walking around with your guys, practice land navigation, um, get into some shoot, move, communicate scenarios, drop some casualties so you've got an evac, send a flanking element out, and then lose contact with them. So now these guys got to figure out what the hell to do. Do they go looking for these guys? Do they say fuck them and bound away and get out of there? What do these guys do when they left contact? Do they continue the mission and go do their job? Or do they realize, hey, we don't have support by fire. We might die. It's the beauty of infantry doctrine. It is purposely left to the bare bones basics so that you have smart guys on the ground who will make decisions. Hopefully your team leader is that guy. Um, if not, that's why you train constantly. Just get out in the woods and do this stuff and do it until you're freaking tired of it. And eventually, everybody on your team will know exactly what to do. And at least, if they don't know what to do, they'll be able to evaluate the situation based on all the other metrics. Oacoke, MetTC, and stuff. So, let me know if you guys want to see more tactics uh, with beer cans, because I don't have G.I. Joe figures. And until the next one, I'll see you out there. Team leader's dead. Sniper. Since the team leader's dead. He's totally dead. We left him. <laughs>